Hi, everybody. Well, welcome to our last week of ancient Greek thought. Our topic today is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. This concludes our short unit on Aristotle. Now, the Nicomachean Ethics, of course, is a really expansive book. There are lots of major themes, actually, that we probably should be touching upon, but won't be able to. Those include justice, uh, intellectual virtue, uh, other things. We're going to focus on four themes that I think are defining enough to merit inclusion in our short treatment. That is happiness, virtue, friendship, and contemplation, which for Aristotle, as we'll see, is the highest form of happiness. So moving through each of those, let's dive in. All right. So starting with our first theme of happiness, and I've put under the heading here the portion of the text that this refers to. So we're in book one, uh, chapters one, four to five, and seven. Now, Aristotle starts by looking around. This is how Aristotle always starts. Uh, he does not start with his head in the clouds. He does not start asking about, you know, abstract ideas. He looks at what people actually do and say about things. In this case, he starts with looking at various skills and inquiries, or just referring to them, and makes the observation that any skill that you have, any inquiry that you engage in, inquiry is just a search for something, right, has some kind of end. And that end or purpose of the thing is its good. So if I want to play the violin, I have seen other people do it. I have a sense of what is good in that field, and that is my end, right? And when I achieve it, that is a good. Now, moving on into chapter four, chapters two and three deal with political science, which is one of those things that we won't be able to talk about today. Uh, we find that happiness is agreed by all, so he's still in that mode of, you know, saying what people agree with, uh, to be the highest achievable good but they don't agree on what happiness is. So we can see that not much has changed in 2,400 years. Uh, in chapter five, he builds on this and he does exactly what you would uh, expect him to do, which is say, okay, well, what do people say about happiness? He identifies a few things, pleasure, honor, and wealth, right? Usually when people talk about happiness, they mean one of these things. He's gonna say, none of these things is happiness, right? None of these things will actually bring you happiness. Um, all of them are good. I mean, it's better to have pleasure, honor, and wealth than not. Again, we're talking in a practical, everyday sense, right? I prefer to have those things. Uh, but none of them is an end in itself. All of them are a means to some further end, right? Uh, now, take the example of wealth, right? I don't, not, I don't want money, simply because I want to have a lot of paper or just see a high number on my bank account. I want money in order to be able to do something with that money. Uh, and that's what Aristotle is getting at here. Money is not an end in itself. So in chapter seven, he moves on to talk about the actual highest attainable good. He already identified this before. Um, he identifies happiness as something worth choosing in itself and never for the sake of something else. So already it's surged beyond pleasure and honor and wealth in the ranking. Uh, and he writes about happiness. Um, the human good turns out to be activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. And if there are several virtues, in accordance with the best and most complete. Again, this must be over a complete life. Famous line here. For one swallow does not make a summer, nor one day. Neither does one day or a short time make someone blessed and happy. Okay, now you might ask, why do I have this picture of this uh, smiling girl on, on the slide? Well, I chose this because she is engaged, as you can see, in an activity. She is doing something, right? And this is a key part of Aristotle's understanding of happiness. Um, we haven't yet given the Greek word uh, for happiness, which is eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. Uh, for Aristotle, eudaimonia is an activity. And as he puts it here, an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. 
right? So happiness is not something that you can, you know, reach out and, and grasp and take and hold on to, right? Happiness is something that you experience in doing something, you know, in an activity. Uh, and I think all of us can probably relate to this, right? Uh, when were you happy? Well, usually when you're happy, uh, I mean, sometimes you might reflect on the fact that you're happy, uh, but characteristically, you, you won't be thinking about your happiness, right? You'll simply be happy uh, in an unreflective kind of way in the moment itself, right? And for Aristotle, this is a key feature of happiness. It's not a feeling, it's something that we do, and we experience it in the course of doing. Also, this business about the swallow. Swallow is a bird, right? Um, not one swallow does not make a summer. So you can't be happy just for a portion of your life or for a couple days or here and there, right? The goal is to establish happiness as part of your character. And we're going to see that in discussing virtue in a moment. Something that stays with you, something that's reliable and doesn't fail all the time, right? Uh, that's the goal. I mean, probably, I'm not sure I've achieved it. I don't know if you've achieved it. Uh, but for Aristotle, that's what we are aiming at. Okay, so if happiness is a state of the soul in accordance with virtue, or an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue, then we need to ask, what is virtue? Well, here is where we're going to cover a bit of the same ground as last time, but in greater detail and with the benefit of Aristotle's own text. So in chapters 5, 6, 7 of book 2, of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, Aristotle discusses this. Chapter 5, uh, virtue is a state, not a feeling or a capacity. Uh, so it's not an ability to do something. It's not an emotion that we have. It's a state that, that you acquire over time by repeated activity in uh, accordance with that virtue. Uh, so what kind of state is it? Well, he defines it precisely. The virtue of a human being will be the state that makes a human being good and makes him perform his characteristic activity well. Right? So good and well. Um, both of these things are referring to, first of all, to human beings, obviously, right? But they're referring to particular situations, right? In each situation, in each skill or inquiry, in each activity, there will be a different end, a different good, and therefore, Virtue will take a different form. But we need to understand virtue in relation to vice, hence the picture. So let's look at the next point. Uh, as we discussed last time, uh, there is, Aristotle writes, an excess, a deficiency, and a mean in actions. Whenever he says mean, just hear average, right? A, a moderate uh, position, a middle way. An excess, a deficiency, and a mean. Virtue is concerned with feelings and actions in which excess and deficiency constitute misses of the mark, while the mean, average, is praised and on target, both of which are characteristics of virtue. So we have an archery metaphor, right? There's the bullseye. We're going to aim at the bullseye. Boink! Hit the bullseye, right? That is virtue. Didn't go too far to the left or the right, up or down. Didn't miss the <laughs> miss the bullseye entirely, or what do you call it, the target, right? Um, and in most skills and activities, he's saying, this kind of measure is our standard, right? There's not an absolute form of archery, right? That's Plato's approach. Uh, there is rather, in the doing, uh, a recognizable hitting of the target. Now, in some cases, uh, it is actually a little more black and white than that. And he lists a few of those, adultery, theft, and homicide. Uh, so, I mean, taking adultery, right? There, There's no good way to do adultery. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do too little adultery or too much adultery, but just enough, you know, with the right person in the right place at the right time. No, Aristotle says no. Oh, that's just rationalization, right? Those kinds of things simply are, they don't admit of an excess or deficiency. They're not skills or inquiries of the kind he's looking at. Um, and in chapter 7, uh, you'll see that he discusses some examples of virtue, especially courage, uh, which we'll touch upon in a minute. So here's our table that we had last time, thanks to whomever has produced this uh, for us. So we have virtue in the middle, referring to moderation. We have deficiency and excess. And as we discussed last time, so courage is between cowardice and being foolhardy, 
right? So now, how do you know? I mean, is there an absolute, can I just like write a rule and say, in all cases, do this? Uh, and Aristotle would say, no, you know, it depends on the situation, depends on who you are, who you're with, what you have, what's going on, right? Uh, same thing with all of the other virtues listed here. And here we have another chart that we saw last time, but it's good to review here. Uh, remember, one swallow does not make a summer. One act does not make you happy. You need to engage in that act again and again and again in order to form a habit. Out of a habit, uh, establish part of your character, right? And then from that character, uh, acquire a certain state of mind uh, that's going to make you more disposed to engage again in the act. So this is a virtuous cycle uh, as compared to a vicious cycle, a phrase that we might often hear. A vicious cycle is something that lands you in vice. A virtuous cycle lands you in virtue. All right, so let's, before we move on to our next uh, and third topic, have a look at the actual um, definition that Aristotle gives of virtue uh, in Book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Virtue, he writes, is a state involving rational choice, consisting in a mean relative to us and determined by reason. The reason, that is, by reference to which the practically wise person would determine it. Okay, so it's a state. It involves rational choice. So I'm, I'm presented with a choice. What am I going to do, X or Y? Well, I choose Y, right? That's a rational choice that I made. Um, it is... Uh, determined by reason, uh, by reference to which the practically wise person would determine it. So what is his standard here? Is it, you know, a revelation from God? Is, is it an uh, ideal form? No, it's what a practically wise person would do. So his reference is, in fact, other people, right? This, in a way, is a very community-based kind of ethic. Look around you. See who the apparently virtuous people are. Who seems happy? You know, if you're a guitar player, who is a really good guitar player? Uh, try to be like that person, right? That's your standard. Uh, it is a mean, he says, between two vices, one of excess, the other of deficiency. It is a mean also in that some vices fall short of what is right in feeling and actions, and others exceed it, while virtue uh, both attains and chooses the mean. So he's defining here that relation between virtue and the two vices on either side. So in respect of its essence and the definition of its substance, virtue is a mean. While with regard to what is best and good, it is an extreme. Right? What does he mean by that? Uh, with regard to what is best and good, it's the best thing you can do. It's extremely good. Right? But with regard to um, its essence and definition of its substance, so, you know, what is it in itself? Well, it's something in relation to those two um, extremes on either side. Let's talk about friendship. Now, I've taken the liberty here of adding a photo or, of a, a work, a painting, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia. Um, two former Supreme Court justices, well, former because they, they are now deceased, uh, but, you know, elected in the 80s and um, throughout the 90s and early 2000s, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG, uh, was, you know, uh, a, a champion of liberal causes on the court, and Scalia was often a champion of, of what were seen as conservative causes. Uh, and so, ideologically, they couldn't be farther apart, right? But they had this remarkable friendship over decades uh, and a mutual respect for each other that went beyond just, you know, ideological positions um, to something deeper than that. So it seems to me a good example of friendship that we can keep in mind as we discuss Aristotle's text. So this theme of friendship, uh, Aristotle acknowledges what people tend to say about friendship, right? There's, there's a lot of disagreement about, okay, what is, what is it to be a friend? Uh, but then he begins to draw a lot of distinctions. And I'll tell you, that is, if you think it's something about Aristotle, it's the drawing of distinctions, right? Well, you know, there's a contradiction here. Oh, but, you know, there are two different types of something. Okay, so it resolves the contradiction. What he wants to talk about here, um, he starts from natural friendships uh, between parents and children, moves on to friendships between cities, 
friendships between two good people, between two bad people, um, between, you know, uh, good and bad people, friendships between the young and old age, uh, and discusses some of this in the beginning of our selection. Um, he also talks about the affection that we might have for non-people, you know, for soulless objects, so I guess not even, you know, not living things, um, and people who don't even know each other. So I might have goodwill towards someone that I hear about on the news. Right? I've never met that person, so we wouldn't call that friendship. We'd call it goodwill, right? And the same thing with, I don't know, I, I, I love my violin, right? It's just so important to me. Uh, I have affection for it, but you wouldn't say that you're friends with, uh, with your violin. So we're, you know, homing in on, on what friendship for him is going to mean. In terms of friendship proper, he talks about three kinds, and this is neat and easy to remember, and I find very helpful. So there are friendships of utility, friendships of pleasure, and friendships of virtue, and the last of these he calls complete friendship. So pleasure and utility, those kinds of friendships are going to fall short a bit. They're not complete. Friendship of virtue is complete. Friendships of utility, he says, are based on what two people can do for each other. Often they will not even enjoy being together, right? Uh, so, you know, when you, when you are transacting business with somebody, right? I mean, Aristotle would call that a kind of friendship. Uh, we might say it's a, you know, certainly not an enemy relationship if you're transacting business. Uh, but, you know, we might not use the word friendship usually to describe that. Uh, Aristotle does. Uh, and friendships of pleasure, he says, we enjoy each other, right? So he includes, I mean, what we might call dating relationships here, erotic friendships. Uh, and they can be very pleasant and they, they can be very good, uh, but they are not for him uh, yet complete friendship. Complete friendship, that is, a friendship of virtue, is between good people, people who are alike in their virtue. Uh, they each uh, like, uh, alike wish good things to each other insofar as they are good and they are good in themselves. So you can be friends with someone whom you regard as similarly virtuous to yourself. Uh, now, that can sound kind of like moralizing, like, oh, you know, why are we so concerned about virtue? But remember, he's just talking about virtue as a, a, a habit of acting with moderation and appropriately in different circumstances, right? So if you share that, uh, it's not about being moral or ethical uh, in the narrow kind of sense. It's about having a similar habit of engaging with the world. And with those sorts of people, he thinks, um, similar to ourselves, we can be friends in the complete sense. So here is a nice little chart from At Wise Healthy Wise, I think, At Wise Healthy Wise for producing this chart. Um, friendships of utility. This is based on mutual benefits. So your coworkers, right? Hairstylist or barber, clients, sure. You have friendly relations with them. Aristotle would call them friends of utility. Friendships of pleasure based on fun, right? These friendships are not very deep. These are drinking buddies. You see them at the bar, well, not during COVID, uh, hobbyists, uh, athletic uh, partners, you know, uh, pickup teams, things like that. Um, you're not close with them. You enjoy being with them. It's nice, you know, but you're not really uh, sharing uh, intimate details of your life with them. Uh, by contrast, we have friendships of good, as Wise Healthy Wise calls it here. Uh, these are your closest friends. These are friendships of virtue, right? The relationship does not require shared interest to thrive, and these are by far most important. Uh, does not require shared interest, meaning they're not useful friendships exactly, right? They're friendships that are ends in themselves, to use the language that Aristotle um, prefers here. Uh, here's another way of mapping these out. Uh, so friendships of utility and pleasure, this table uh, refers to as accidental friendships. Just happens, you know, happens to be where you are. Well, I don't know, I was in that job, and so I formed friendships with those people. Or when I was in college, you know, I met this or that person, and we got along well, we enjoyed you know, being together, um, but maybe you weren't intimately close with that person. Uh, by contrast, a friendship of virtue is going to be intentional. Uh, not only you, but your uh, friend will choose to be in that friendship, right? And to maintain it over time because of your mutual appreciation 
of one another's character. Uh, Aristotle writes, for pleasure or u for utility, then, even bad people can be friends with each other, <laughs> or good people with bad, or one who is neither good nor bad with a person of any sort. Uh, but clearly, only good people can be friends for the sake of the other person himself, because bad people do not enjoy each other's company unless there is some benefit in it for them. Worth re reflecting on these words. Only good people can be friends for the sake of the other person himself. You know, one phrase that Aristotle uses in connection with friendship, he says the friendship is an alter ego. And that's where we get the term alter ego. Um, it's another self. Alter means other, ego means self, right? So a friend, uh, in the fullest, complete sense, becomes like an extension of yourself and you for them, right? You care about that person uh, in the same unconditional way uh, and natural way that you care uh, for yourself. He points out that distance does not dissolve friendship without qualification, that is, friendships, uh, complete friendships, friendships of virtue, uh, but it does dissolve uh, its activity. So even if you're not with someone, maybe, maybe you have a friend who is still uh, an alter ego for you, you know, someone very close to you, you haven't seen them in years, uh, so you're not engaged in the activity of that friendship, and yet you would still regard that person importantly for you as a friend. Last slide on friendship here. Um, friendship is not a, a feeling. Um, it is, in the same way virtue is, uh, a state. Right? So the good person, in coming to be a friend, comes to be a good for his friend. So you seek the good of your friend. You help them to live a good life. Uh, even happy people need friends, uh, not just utility or pleasure friends, but virtuous friends. Um, and he considers, you know, how many friends can we have? I think in the time of Facebook, this is a, a worthwhile question to ask. Uh, there is some limit to their number, Aristotle says. And presumably, this is the largest number in the company of whom one can live because that seemed to be the most characteristic element in friendship. So if you have, you know, 1,200 Facebook friends, um, then that's probably too many, right? But if, if you have a certain number of close friends uh, where you are, uh, this could be sustainable for Aristotle and meet the definition of a virtuous friendship. The presence of friends, he says, seems worth choosing in all circumstances, good or ill. So even if you're living a happy life, you're contemplating all the time, uh, it is always worth choosing to have and to be with friends. Here's our last um, theme for today from the reading. So remember, we've seen that happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. We've seen that virtue is a kind of mean between excesses vice and deficiency. And we've looked at kind of a sidebar of friendship as an important expression uh, of our happiness and, and means of developing it. Uh, here we have the most complete form of happiness itself. Uh, and Aristotle calls this contemplation. And I've found an image, I suppose, of uh, someone contemplating. What does it mean to contemplate? Well, Aristotle says that this is the most pleasant activity that we can engage in. It's an activity that accords with wisdom. We can contemplate, he says, alone uh, or with other people, and it has no end beyond itself. It is its own pleasure, self-sufficient, it's le leisurely, so it's not rushed, and it does not tire us out. He says, contemplation is the complete happiness for a human being. And what does contemplation mean? Um, I mean, looking at the girl on the bench here, right? She doesn't have her phone out. Uh, she's not with anybody, as it so happens. She's, what would you say, thinking, reflecting, something like this. Um, it seems that what she's doing does not have any particular goal, right? She, she just is in that moment. And this is something that in our busy lives we might feel we rarely have occasion for. Uh, but for Aristotle, despite its rarity, it is the highest and best thing that we can do. Simply putting ourselves in the presence of something, thinking, reflecting, and as he would put it, contemplating it. A uh, little uh, flashback here. This is a slide we had last week on Aristotle's psychology. Um, but just to get a sense of why is this the highest form of happiness, right? Well, remember we had these three types of soul, plant, animal, and human. 
Um, the vegetative soul of the plant is concerned with reproduction and growth. The animal soul adds to that mobility and sensation. And I say adds to it because it, of course, retains those other faculties of reproduction and growth. But for human beings who have, as Aristotle puts it, a, a rational soul, um, the uh, characteristic faculties of that rational soul are thought and reflection. So thought and reflection for Aristotle are what make us human, right? We're also animals. And like plants, we also have capacities or faculties of, of reproduction and growth. But engaging in this activity of contemplation, which I, I should hope has it happened from time to time in our ancient Greek thought class, um, is for Aristotle what makes us characteristically human. Um, last passage on this from Aristotle. This is from book um, 10, chapter 7 of the, of the Ethics. We'll read it and then comment and then wrap up. Uh, Such a life, he says, is superior, that is a life of contemplation, to one that is simply human. Because someone lives thus, not in so far as he is a human being, but in so far as there is some divine element within him. If the intellect then is something divine compared with the human being, the life in accordance with it will also be divine compared with with human life. Let's take a pause here. So remember for Aristotle, the unmoved mover, God as the unmoved mover, moves the whole system, that cosmology that we saw, by thinking, by contemplating and reflecting, right? That's how God works. Now, lo and behold, we ourselves have that same faculty. We are able to do that same thing. And so to engage in that activity, is because, Aristotle says here, divine element within us. But more than that, to live a life that has that activity prominently within it is a life that is higher than just, you know, say, pleasure or utility, honor or wealth, right? These are, these are appropriate human ends, but they're not the highest human end. Uh, and as he puts it, this kind of life will be divine compared with human life. Continuing, but we ought not to listen to those who exhort us because we are human to think of human things or because we are mortal, think of mortal things. We ought rather to take on immortality as much as possible and do all that we can to live in accordance with the highest element within us. For even if its bulk is small, in its power and value, it far exceeds everything. Even if its bulk is small, we have jobs, we have responsibilities, families, many things to attend to. But even if its bulk is small, right? Even if our moments for contemplation are rare, our capacity to do that and developing that as a habit, Aristotle thinks, um, can immeasurably enrich our lives and help us, in fact, to become fully human. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and I hope you've enjoyed our course, Ancient Greek Thought. It has been a pleasure walking with you through the pre-Socratics, Socrates, Plato, uh, and now Aristotle. Uh, I hope this activity has, huh, this activity in accordance with virtue, has brought you many new things to think about. That you've learned a lot, uh, and I hope that this uh, stays with you in a useful way going forward. So I wish you very well, and I look forward to reading your final essays.